Thank you, thank you very much. I very much appreciate your clapping in advance. You're not going to do that at the end, so it's good. Um, Caroline's speech was moving and amazing. Mine is not going to be, so relax yourself. Um, usually, as Christa Christiana was saying, I give a very technical talks, so people try to look for the safety exits and tries to get out mid-speech. This time, it's not going to be anything like that. This time is going to be, as the title says, complex things explained easily. This is my uh, attempt at explaining many things that usually come across as very complex. They are not. They're just explained it very poorly, which is the problem that we have in tech usually. People tend to use very complex words and concepts to explain something simple. And I will try to shed some light on some things. So who am I? As Cristiano said, I'm a back-end WordPress developer. I say back-end because if you make me do front-end, eventually I'm going to run into CSS, eventually I'm going to complain it's not a Turing complete language, and I'm going to give up. So that's my problem. I'm a maker. I like to build stuff me with my hands. I like to build stuff with my hands with uh, usually a good dose of over-engineering, like I tend to solve problems that are not existing with very complex uh, solutions. I'm going to do that in my free time, by the way. I'm a Wikipedia donor. I like to say that because uh, Wikipedia essentially provides like half of the slides of any WordCamp. So if you're making a speech, please do do donate something to Wikipedia. And you can follow me on Twitter, and if you want, if you really want, and you can read my blog again if you really want. No, no real, no real value. So, uh, ours is a complex world. So both our world, so the, like Earth, is complex, but also WordPress community world is a complex world because uh, being ignorant of something is perceived, especially in the higher level of technical skills as a, as a capital sin. It's not something you can admit to. It's not something that you can say. No one expects a developer especially to say something that like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Like you have to know about any new framework. It could be React, Vue, Redis, whatever. Anything, you have to know exactly what they are. You, you can't say you don't know them. So we have a ton of buzzwords flying around like ninja stars, like shurikens. So you, you kind of have to dodge them to, to survive, to make, to make your day. But what I found out is that when you get to talk with people, actually very few of them know what they're talking about. Most of them <laughs> just fake knowledge. So I'm giving you the means to fake knowledge with some knowledge, but still, it's still fake knowledge. Don't, don't trust me on anything I say. That. Uh, that's as a, as a general rule. So it's going to be complex things explained easily, so they're going to be uh, stick figures that I've drawn myself. So I apologize in advance, and that's why you will not be clapping at the end. So this is a thing that really happened to me. Uh, I was interviewing a developer, and I asked, have you ever worked with Bradis? And he replied saying, no, but I'm sure she's great. <laughs> So <laughs> this, is, this is real, this happened to me. I was laughing so hard that I really wanted to hire the developer. I was, of course, I was not the people in charge of doing that. Uh, but still, this happened. Uh, if, you do, if you can understand the joke, Redis is a database system. We can use very complex definition. It's, it's like a database system, database caching system. But it's also a female name. So as many projects have, this happened. So today we can do this, okay? One day we will be able to stick a chip in our brain and we will know JavaScript deeply, like Neo just did. Uh, we can do that yet. We have to actually learn stuff the old way. So we have to look it up and try it out and fail repeatedly and try to overcome difficulties of knowledge and gathering the knowledge that we need. We can do that. So um, the first source of confusion that I found is that even in a context like this one, you meet people and you ask them a simple question, which is, what do you do? And they will reply with, I'm a something designer. Everyone is a designer. So uh, like in this, uh, in this stripe, I'm the MySQL developer happiness and satisfaction designer. If you know MySQL, you know that's a hard job. It's going to be difficult. And 
social media baker is actually a real reply that I got. Someone told me they are a social media baker. No idea what they do. <laughs> but this is like the first source of confusion. You never know, you, you don't have very clear distinction. I'm a developer, I'm a designer, no one will ever reply you like that. They're gonna use like five or seven words to tell you something. And so the first metaphor that I want to use is that I want to try to explain the software development project, especially when it comes to teams, as a movie. So clients are executive producers. It's the people that's putting in the money and giving a general direction. Then you've got strategists and user experience designers, which are screenwriters. So if it was Game of Thrones, they would go from a client idea of nudity and fantasy to Game of Thrones. Okay? It's the people that's actually taking the time to think it out in detail. Then you've got project managers, which is a miserable job, and they are line producer. They stay on the set to make sure that the movie stays in time and in budget and people is not complaining, a developer is not throwing a fit or something like that. You've got lead developers. They are like directors, so they actually help coordinating everyone, making sure everyone knows what they're doing, the sheen is correct, the screenwriting is actually matching the sheens and so on. No one is wearing a watch during a fantasy movie, stuff like that. Um, so you've got developers that are, in this case, cast and operators. They're not, they would like to be the actors. They're not. I'm sorry to disclose that to you. And so they are the guys that are both playing in the movie and help and filming the movie. And then you've got QA people. QA stands for quality assurance. It's the people that are, that's looking at the movie after it's almost done and says, well, it's okay, or like the feeling doesn't get across too well, it's limited, stuff like that, okay? So now that you've got like these five big groups of people, try to narrow the definition that they give you to, the, to each one of those. Like when they say, when they have the word happiness or something, it, it's usually QA or support. So if you think back at the metaphor about the movie before, this is something that happens all the time with clients. So the metaphor comes very handy in defining why clients tell you one thing, you understand another, and end up doing another yet. So the problem is that think of this as the Lord of the, of, of the Rings. So the client tells you, and then the dwarf, the dwarf throws the ring in the volcano, and you're a developer, so you're now to say, well, I, you mean the old fling, not, not the dwarf. And they say, yes, the short one. And so you say, well, the short one, both dwarfs and all flings are short, and they say, yes, the good ones. So that's exactly how client interactions go in a language that developers can understand, which is Lord of the Rings. Um, and, and, and go on, for, for, for all eternity. So if you want to know the mystery of life when applied to why developers do not understand clients, that's it, that's all in this slide. So um, you know that whenever you get to build a project, you have to build on something, so you usually build on frameworks. Can any kind of framework, React, Vue.js, WordPress. WordPress is a framework as well. The idea of a framework is that allows people to build things faster. Okay, because it provides you with a basic structure on which you can build that you don't have to repeat again, you don't have to reinvent the wheel, and stuff like that. So if supposedly frameworks should allow you to do things faster, why is that not always the case? Why do people sometimes get stuck and projects take a lot of, a lot of time? So think about Lego, okay? This is a Lego brick. If you've never seen, seen one, I'm sorry for you. Yours has been probably a very bad life. Um, I've been using Lego as a deterrent for my mother for years. Like scattering them on the floor proved to be a very effective method of keeping her away. And, but the good thing about Lego bricks is that you can do anything with them. In a way, Legos are frameworks, correct? You've got pieces, like use small unit pieces that you can assemble and you can used to build something very complex. But frameworks can be a pain because as I said before, someone is walking bare feet and they stomp on a Lego, they're gonna remember that day as the worst day of their lives, okay? Until it's their, it's their like son or daughter doing that to them. So at that point, you, you, you just replace the worst day of your life over and over. Um, but this is it. So 
if you think, if you keep thinking about Lego, what happens if you need a curved piece? Like, you really need this piece. Like, this is really the piece of Lego that you need. It's not existent. Just want to disclose that to you. It does not exist. So, anyone which is Lego enthusiast, which is uh, getting all excited about curved pieces, no, they do not exist. Um, but if you need that, that's going to be a problem because it's not provided. And not only you have to build it, but you have to make it fit into something that was built only to fit square pieces. Okay? So until you have a project that only, only includes using square pieces to do squares or rectangles or cubes, everything goes extremely fine. You know what? The client comes and they want the curved pieces in the middle of the project because that's when you disclose that you want the curved pieces. Um, at that point, you have to make it fit. It's hard, it takes time, it takes a lot of engineering and re-engineering and rethinking of your whole structure or of the piece. So that's why sometimes frameworks help you a ton, but sometimes they can be a blocker, okay? So I know there is someone in you that probably you are a developer and you're thinking, I know, I have the solution, I can go framework-less. I will not use any framework, okay? We all know that on a mountain lives a sage that once did it all without frameworks. I've never known anyone that had successfully completed a project not using a framework. There is people that say they did it. I've never seen one complete it. There is always someone that will tell you something. Yeah, yeah, no, I made an e-commerce engine because that commerce plugin sucks. And I, I did one that's way better. Oh, good, can I see it? No, it's not live yet. <laughs> um, so this is a joke. If you don't get that, it's because you have never had to deal with the clients that want out of playing videos. So, okay. So we go down one level from frameworks. We said uh, WordPress is a framework that allows you to do a ton of things. The way that WordPress allows you to do a ton of things is using hooks. Hooks can be actions and filters. Is anyone inside here? Has anyone inside here never heard before about actions and filters? You can raise your hand, no shame in it. I'm just going to point it to you. <laughs> you are a shame. Um, so it's a core functionality. It's essentially, it's the way that WordPress can be extended and completely change in, in its behavior and, feel, and flow, okay? Um, in that it's what provides themes and plugins a way to completely change what you can do and what you can essentially, out the way you can manage WordPress. So um, it's difficult to understand as a concept. Uh, if I was explaining that to a developer, I would say it, that WordPress is, a chance, is essentially an event-driven framework, okay? That's it. Events happen, you hook on those events, you do something when a certain event, event happen. But you, know, you can say that because that's complex, so I have to provide a simpler metaphor to make that stick to your mind. So if you, have, if you ever ever seen Dune, the movie, you know sandworms of Arrakis. They are big, they eat sand, they tunnel and burrow through sand, and they come out and eat people and things and destroy everything. But for the time being, keep, keep that, in, keep this to, to mind. So you've, you've got, a, this is a big worm, very big. So this is essentially what happens when you hook. So if the worm is WordPress, this is making its way around the desert. This is you. Um, in the, this is a very bad reproduction that a kid made of the screen cap. I might be the kid. Uh, of you riding WordPress around. So WordPress is the sandworm. This is you riding the sandworm. This is you riding WordPress because you hooked on WordPress. So if you don't get it, it's because you're, you've never seen Dune. If you have seen Dune, you've got that scene into your mind, you, your understanding. So English is, my, is not my mother language, just, just an advice for developers. Uh, anyone that's hooking on WordPress is called a developer. Don't be tempted to call anything that hooks in any other way. <laughs> I did that <laughs> in, a, in a plugin and <laughs> I was able to, QA people was able to catch the fact that we had a non-aptly named class in the project because it was a class that was hooking, so it made sense to call it like that. So, but no, developer is good, and manager, event handler is okay. Don't, don't, do, don't do what I did. 
So uh, let's go back completely out of the framework space, of the WordPress space. Let's go to DNS. Uh, do you all know what DNS stands for? Good. Uh, it means domain name resolution and essentially is going from a human readable string to an IP address of a physical machine that's existing somewhere and it's reachable in the web, okay? Fact is that we found out very early that people is very bad at keeping long strings of number at mine. And so we decided that it would be useful to go from those strings of numbers to human readable names. So we came up with, for example, WordPress.org instead of having to use 198, blah, 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 and so on. Um, what the, uh, domain name resolution happens uh, every time you type it, the name of the website, like WordPress.org, in your address bar, and then your browser has to go some places. It has to go and fetch that information from a machine that can only be found through an IP address. So um, if your browser has not visited the machine recently, it will not know how to translate that name to the number, so they need to find so think of your browsers as a taxi. So you want to go to some place and you're essentially going to the taxi driver and saying that you want to go to your Uncle Bob's house. But that's a place in your head that does not exist. There's no Uncle Bob's house. Not, it's not a place that the taxi driver actually knows that they need an address to go to, okay? Uh, because names are a product of our fantasy, of yours fantasy, probably. So. Meet the first real blockchain implementation ever, which is the DNS tables. DNS tables is essentially, it's very complex, but in essence, it's a table that has got the name of the website and an IP address. That's all there is to it. So your browser can, can go to the domain name resolution server and say, hey, I have got to go to WordPress.org. Can you give me the current and up-to-date address of the website? And that table will give one back. Um, it's a blockchain because, do you all know what blockchain is? Perfect. This is a typical example of everyone nodding yes, no one knowing exactly what that is. Okay, that's okay. Um, so the table is too big to exist on your computer because it turns out there are a lot of websites. Um, since it's too big, it's not on your computer. It's in some servers on the web. What is the problem? That continuously new websites are either created, old websites are deleted, uh, some websites are moved, so their IP address changes, and you have to keep up with that. How do you keep up with that? You have uh, that table that I've shown before has to be updated in its records, but when, for example, I update mine, I then have to transmit my update to everyone else. So eventually, the change that has, has happened in my table propagates to all the other tables. And the same happens in the other direction. If any, changes, if any change happens in tables in another place, they have to get to me before I know, okay? That's why when you activate a website or you move a website, they will tell you that it takes 24 to 48 hours for DNS to propagate. Now you know why, because that table has to be updated in every, in all the world, okay? It's a blockchain because essentially no server has all the information up to date. The information is up to date because it lives in all the servers and it's replicated. So if an, even if one DNS server goes down, you always have a backup in another, okay? So this is essentially how DNS servers work. They spend all, all the day trying to exchange like figures, like kids do. So do you have an address? No, I don't. Then give it to me. Or do you have an address? Yes, I do. What's the address? This is it, and so on. They go on all day bargaining addresses uh, all day. This is an Italian joke that you do when you, for example, when you've got sticker albums. And when you've got a figurine, you would say cello, which means I have it. And when you, don't, when you don't have it, you would say manka, which means I miss it. Uh, so it's probably understandable only by, uh, by Italians, but I mean, you get the idea. So it's not, it's not tragic. Um, so as I said, it takes time, takes time to prop propagate, and that's why uh, DNS propagation happens in a long time, okay? So when you've got DNS, you can then make 
HTTP requests. So when you're, for example, entering startcoffee.com, your browser now knows that that URL is actually an address, an IP address, can go to it and fetch something. So when you make an HTTP request, you're essentially, it's a, you have to think of it as a, exactly as you would think about ordering a coffee in a, any coffee shop, modern coffee shop. So you could make a very crazy receipt like I want to try latte deep fried soy, soy milk rainbow cafe. And they have to go from that strange request to something that makes sense or not. So what happens is that um, usually when you use a website, you make a get request, which means that you want to get something from the website. Anytime you browse the web, you're always essentially making get requests. When you're submitting a form, you're probably making a post request because you're sending information to the website. You can make other kind of requests like patch that does what you think. And then you can do delete that deletes information in the website. Of course, uh, put, patch, and delete, uh, which are usually critical operations. You can only do if you're allowed to, like in the e example of WordPress, anyone can visit the website, but probably it's not safe to let anyone edit the posts, okay, or delete them. It's something that you would want to limit, which is limited by default, that's, that's why. And so if you think, um, if you keep go back to the restaurant idea, uh, it, it works exactly like a restaurant, like you can go into a restaurant and get some food, but if you want to put something in the restaurant, you have to be someone that they actually trust, like you can't leave your pet crocodile Catherine inside the restaurant because they don't know you, okay? So they're gonna, they're gonna stop you eventually. Um, so let's see the typical URL and understand what's happening. So, for example, this is a local website, HTTP w dot test w at, um, sorry uh, slash wp admin edit php post type event. So there are some pieces to it. HTTP uh, wp test is the URL. Then you've got a path, which is edit dot, uh, wp admin um, uh, slash edit dot php. And then you've got a query arg, which is, I want the post type of type event, okay? So you will hear this thing a lot. Uh, many people actually found out have no idea what, what is what, so they will call path or fragment or URL, anything that's not a URL or a path fragment. Um, it's just good to know, it's just good to have a, a general idea of what you're talking about. You then have got fragments. Fragments, it's something that you use to do what's called in-page in links. So it's the hashtag and then parameters, for example, is what would allow us to directly go not only inside the all options codex page on WordPress, codex, but to go straight to the parameters section of that page. So you could have a very long page that is presenting a lot of information and you want to hot link someone exactly into a specific piece of the page. That's called a fragment. Okay, so hashtag fragment. It's easy, it's easy to remember. So you have specified an extremely complex order and someone has to prepare it. So if they can translate from what you said to something that actually exists, that will present you with a cup of coffee because get back, you're in a coffee shop. And if you want to have your brand on the cup, you can contact me for future presentations. Um, if they can't, because you made an order that does not exist or they can't prepare it in this very moment, they will give you a 404 page. Uh, 404 pages used to be like the last page that any designer would do because it's essentially, it's a 404 page. It's, it's a disaster, it's something bad has happened. I love how important the design of 404 pages has become. So now today we use 404 pages the same way that we would try to break up gently with our ex. So it's like, yeah, it's, I mean, it's not you, it's me. It's like, I couldn't find the page, I'm sorry, but really do not, it's not you, it's not your fault, it's nothing, it's, it just happens. So we try now to be, to be very, very tactful when it comes to communicating the fact that we did not find a page, so much so that many times you have no idea it's a 404 page. Okay, that's not what I expected, but it's good. So, change of argument completely, virtualization, 
Has any one of you ever heard about Docker, VVV, VirtualBox, Vagrant, stuff like that? Raise your hands. Okay, just to know that you're still not full asleep. So essentially, virtualization from Wiki Wikipedia, I had to pull something from Wikipedia. In computing, virtualization refers to the act of creating a virtual rather than actual version of something, including virtual computer hardware platforms, storage devices, and computer net network resources. Okay, what this means essentially is this. If you've seen the Truman Show, the operative system thinks is living in a world which is real, it's not real, it's a fake world, and we are looking at it from the outside. That's what virt virtualization does. It, when, even when you're using dockers, containers, blah, 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 whatever, that's all there is to it, okay? It's done in a different way. You build the world in a different way, but essentially this is all there is to it. So one could ask, why would I want to virtualize anything? Why would I want to virtualize like Windows or Unix or Mac OS or whatever? Um, so let's do an example, simple example. So you've got a friend that's called Bob. Bob is a very good dancer, like in his heart, Bob is a dancer, but he had to make other life choices, like now he's a developer, for example. And, but Bob has got a weak point, by, like Bob will only dance at birthday, birthday parties for someone that's called Janet, and only if there is a full moon. So it's quite specific to see Bob dancing, okay? You can have Bob dancing every day. That's quite a cross of, of events. But if you can create a fake world where every day is Janet's birthday and every day is a full moon, Bob will dance every day. That's very good. The, the werewolf is actually to indicate that there's a full, full moon. Um, <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have to admit that I tried to do uh, a flash dance. Cap, my, no, was, was very bad. was really a bad idea to an extent. So... This is why you would want to virtualize. I'm not going to go into any more details, but this is what you have to keep in mind. Something that would happen very, uh, in a very specific situation, you can make happen every time you want, okay? Without having to worry about compatibility issues. This program does not work, does not work with this one. This is a Unix-only program. This is a MacOS-only program and stuff like that. Change of, change of argument, again. This is another big buzzword at the moment, which is artificial intelligence, and in particular, machine learning. So machine learning is a very romantic name that inspires everyone to think about Skynet, which is the end of the world uh, apparatus that brought down the world in the universe of Terminator. So I had to make a joke. I mean, you have, it's kind of mandatory now to use this picture when you talk about artificial intelligence. So I would like to answer your questions, like will machines run the world in the future? And is it true that Facetube knows all my secrets? I probably, from the latest news, yes, but. <laughs> <laughs> so let me explain you extremely simply in a very rough cut approach what machine learning is. So quick question, what is the next shape going to be? I'm going to give you 10 seconds because I'm running out of time. Circle? Circle. Circle. Nope. That's wrong. The next one will be a triangle. And the reason is that you've got triangle, square, triangle, square, triangle, square, triangle. <laughs> Was easy. Like the statistics were all in front of you. <laughs> okay, this is harder. What, what's the next one going to be? Pentagon. Pentagon. You're not even trying, right? <laughs> okay. Okay, it depends. Because it, if you only take into account the shape that came before that one, the next one is going to be a circle, okay? If you see, on 75% of the cases, the triangle is followed by a circle. So statistics say us that the next shape is going to be a circle. But if you take the previous two shapes, it's another thing. And if you take the three previous shapes, it's another thing. So don't, don't, don't mind band yourself on it. It's not a problem. What you have to understand from artificial intelligence is that uh, it's a good alternative to real stupidity, which is, we've got many examples of it. So is the world going to be ruled by my machines? Yes, but billions of extremely specialized ones, not, one, not Skynet, probably not Skynet. Um, it, it still runs of, on data. So to make any prediction, a machine has to have a ton of data. That's still its limit, okay? We usually, we human beings, we jump into, into the darkness. Machines don't do that. And it still runs on imagination. In the last case, 
you have to tell the machine how to consider what you gave it to know how to predict the next thing. So deciding if it has to take the shape before, two shapes before, three shapes before, it has to take a bi-dimensional pattern and stuff like that, it's a complex thing. It's something that you, the human being, decide. So it's still that. But in essence, it's all statistics, okay? Then big data. When you talk about machine learning, you, you, learn, you talk about big data. Big data is something that people like to call in a very complex way. Once we had a lot of information about a few people or a lot of information about few people. Today, thanks to Facetube, we can have a lot of information about a lot of people. That's big because it's a lot of information and that's data. That's it, that's big data, okay? <laughs> it's nothing, nothing more than that. Then, last thing is OAuth. You probably have seen many times an application that would like to access your Gmail, Facetube profile to do something with your information, blah, 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 stuff like that. Very simply. You've got a friend, she's from San Francisco, from the Silicon Valley, she's called a Janice, she's gonna rock your world, she's gonna be the next development in grocery shopping, and you trust them, okay? So what Janet can do for you is that Janet can go and buy groceries for you, but you don't want Janet to buy all the groceries. That, like she can't go into the, the shop where you have an open tab and buy anything she wants. Janet can only buy something that you specify in advance, okay? So you go to the owner of the shop, that's called a Jim. Jim is clearly old, as you can see from his crew representation. And Jim has got a terrible memory. You're in the middle. You're also very, very, I don't know. I mean, it's a crew representation of you, that. So you make Janet meet Jim. And you tell Jim that now you've got a keyword, a token, which is Fdoprtr, or something like that, this one. And, Jan, and you tell Jim that with that keyword, Janet can only buy pickles for you because you really like pickles, like pickles, like you love pickles, okay? That's the only thing you want Janet to buy for you. So the next time that Janet goes shopping, she goes into the grocery store, she goes to Jim, she says, and Jim knows exactly who she is because, as, you, as I've said before, Jim has got a terrible memory, so he's not going to remember Janet out of the box. He needs a keyword. And he remembers that Janet can only buy pickles. So if Janet buys anything else, he's going to tell, tell Janet, no, you can't. You have to buy pickles, okay? So you can, this is how OAuth work, essentially. Uh, you can revoke a token. So when you revoke a token, you go to Jim, you say, you know, Janet, my, my friend, he will tell, no, I, I have no idea. Well, you have to remove the token, like Janet can't buy groceries for me anymore. She can buy pickles or anything, she can do that anymore. Or you can renew a token. So you can say, Janet can keep buying pickles for me for another year. Or you can update the token and say, Janet can now buy pickles and artichokes for me, okay? That's how OAuth works. So all the things that happens that you go to a we website, then back, and then, hey, your app is connected, that's OAuth. So another thing is in software development, a problem that comes up always is estimation. Uh, estimation, so estimating how much time something is gonna take is always a problem, it's never exact. There is even a theory which is based on scientific data that you can't predict the time that it will take. I'm gonna explain to you very simply from the viewpoint of the developer why you can't predict estimation. So you want to, you ask your catapult crew to tell you exactly how to set up the catapult to hit the walls. And um, because you are a siege manager or you could be an enemy uncomfortable experience designer. Everyone is a designer, remember? So they start and they throw a first rock and the rock is too short, okay? And this is Bob, he's the lead catapulter or rock trajectory designer, he's a designer too. Uh, it's too short at first. So they throw another rock and now it's too long. So they do not hit the city that you wanted to hit, they hit the other one. And so the next thing you're gonna do is that they're gonna throw rocks over and over and over until they hit the correct city. And they're hitting the city because they're, yes. Okay, you get the idea. And they now know exactly how to set the catapult to hit the city. That's exactly how software estimation does. When I'm done, I know exactly how long it will take, okay? What's the problem? The example of the catapult is very good because if you know how, to, how a catapult works, you have to 
you have to essentially uh, disassemble the catapult, move the catapult, reassemble the catapult, set it up again every time you have to siege a new city. That's exactly what happens in development. It's not like cities do not come to the catapult. The catapult goes to the cities. Okay, it's a basic principle of siege. Okay, so th that's exactly the problem. All this disassembling and reassembling comes with a cost that it's never the same. So you can't estimate. Okay, or you can have a very correct estimate. So, last example. I'm going to go through very fast because I'm over time. REST API. We all heard about REST API at least once. So. Pizza is content, okay? This is like, this is a universal fact. This is knowledge, pizza is content. So you can go to the restaurant and get a pizza, okay? So you're getting the content, but also the presentation. And you are a sociopath, so you don't like restaurants. You don't like people, but you really like pizza. That's a problem, okay? What if the restaurant did provide a takeaway service? At that point, you could have pizza, which is the content, without the presentation which is the restaurant. So now the content is exposed with the REST API. The REST API is the takeaway service, okay? But it gets even better because if the restaurant exposes a REST API, a service that can take the pizza from the restaurant and take it to you, it's now an application that uses the REST API, okay? This is all there is to know about REST API. Like if I had to explain REST API in any way which is simpler than that, I would not. It's, it's pizza, you want pizza, you don't want to go to the restaurant to get pizza. You just want pizza. Okay? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luca. It's the best example of REST API I've ever seen uh, in all over the time, all over the world. Question? Please, uh, you have to come here. Uh, but, but we are near, we are near. We are. If you have questions, I'm a failure. I, I have a question. I have a question. Well, a question, Andrea. I knew that. <laughs> I have a question about how to play in a video story. Can you tell me something more about uh, how to play in a video story? No. There were uh, two uh, two times you talked about how to play in videos and uh, your customer. Oh yeah. Uh, it's a very good technique. It forces people to watch videos on a web page if they may not want to. Uh, usually the volume is up, so it's it's very good. You you can research it. There are many WordPress plugins that allow you to do that. Like you can take your whole landing page to show a video. It's very good. Let's on. It's going to be like two petabytes of information that people does not care about. It's very good. I have a question also. La maybe last question. Uh, what kind of virtualization do you suggest to use uh, for developing? Um, the one that's easiest for you to set up. And fastest because your job <laughs> is not doing virtualization, but it's doing code. Thank you. Thank you, Luca, very much.